the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So early on in the pandemic, one of the churches uh, decided that to make the congregation feel a little bit more present for the preacher, uh, the preacher decided that he would take cutouts uh, of all the different people and put them in the pews so that he was looking out at least on uh, uh, two-dimensional people. I thought to myself, I'm sure one or two called and said somebody was sitting in their pew. You know, I look out and there's absolutely no one except Bob at the other end of the uh, nave but this place is far from empty. One of the things that we proclaim on this All Saints Day is that we are in communion with each other. That even if this church is empty, that all of you are gathered around. That This is a foretaste of that heavenly banquet where we are all shoulder to shoulder receiving the same grace and love poured out for us. And that extends to all of you, but that extends even farther, and that's the incredible piece of this day. It is filled with the Easter truth that we participate in that banquet with all those who have gone before us. All those who used to sit in those pews, the names that are stitched on many of the kneelers, maybe the folks that taught you Sunday school, that welcomed you into the choir, that told you you didn't have to be here a certain number of years before you could serve on altar guild. Maybe just the people that you admired watching them Sunday in and Sunday out come with such regularity and commitment and then cascade uh, what they learned and took from Sunday through the rest of their week and their lives. Maybe it was the person that visited you after you first came through these doors that said, welcome, welcome to our parish family. All of these people are gathered around today. That is the bold truth that we claim every Sunday, but especially on this Sunday, that the church is filled with the church triumphant, the people that have carried this church for hundreds of years, the people that have carried the church at large for thousands of years, the people we love and miss and see no longer, the people who call themselves part of this community but can't come and be in this place at this time, and the church yet to come, they're here too. One of the reasons we baptize on this day is we baptize in the acknowledgement that our work in the here and now, our faithfulness, our journey connects the past to the future, creates the way that people for generations to come will come in, put out their hands and receive grace and love and goodness and share it with the world. All of that happens on this day. And when we ring those bells, at the end of the service, when we ring those bells for especially those that we've lost during this past year, but for all those that we've lost, as we hear that sound, we also feel the peace of knowing that they are not just here in memory, but they are in some mystical way still part of our lives, still moving and consciously part of this place, and that they are absolutely enjoying the incredible freedom and delight of being in your arms, in your loving arms, God. That's what this day is about. This day is about that incredible privilege and humble truth that we are part of something much bigger than ourselves, that this is but a moment in something that's been unfolding for so long and is all enveloped in God's time in this moment. Not just a timeline, but part of the same fabric, part of the same communion, part of the same fellowship, gathered around that same heavenly banquet. But there's more. 
many of us on this day remember those whose absence leaves a penetrating hole inside of us. But it is more than just about celebrating those people and remembering those people. It is about what is our call. How do we participate in that communion of saints? How do we live out of that vision that Jesus casts? How do we become a blessing? How do we honor those who mourn and those who suffer and those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake? You know, one of the people that I remember today is a cousin that I had to say goodbye to just in this past week, and he was probably the only hero that I've ever had in my life, even though he was six months younger than me. He was my cousin Travis, and at first when I was younger, I always looked up to him because he was a budding hockey star. Even though he wasn't much bigger than me, he had uh, ascended the ranks, uh, had to leave his small town, Yarmouth, Maine, to go to outside Boston for a bigger sea to swim in to get more attention. And he was recruited by every major hockey school in the country and settled on Boston University, who had just won the previous year's national championship. And he worked so hard and tirelessly that he was going to be able to be on one of the lines on that opening game where they would be hanging the national championship banner. And 11 seconds into that line, his life changed forever. He bounced off somebody he was checking and hit the boards and crushed his fourth and fifth vertebrae and was paralyzed, has been paralyzed for the last 25 years in one week. Then he became my hero because of how he responded to that moment. He's raised millions of dollars to help those who also have suffered spinal cord injuries but didn't have all of the benefits that he had incredible support from his community, from his family, ample insurance and resources, his youth and the ability to recover farther than many other who were still on a ventilator. He also was able to use those funds to give hope to those who have been injured, to help fund research. And those are part of what make him a saint in my, my eyes, but there's more to it. He also became a, a, a motivational speaker, and a couple things uh, that he's often said strike me as the message for this day. You know, he talked about how his first half of his life, the first 20 years, were lived with passion. From the time he was 20 months old, he was on the ice skating, and it was his singular passion until he hit those boards. And he said the second half of his life has been driven with purpose. That he lived the life reshaped, reimagined by events that he had no control over with purpose. How am I going to make meaning? How am I going to live this chapter with purpose? And he calls all of us to examine where are we following our passions and where is our purpose in life. And he also said something else. He said during the first part of his life that he got to choose his challenges. He talked about uh, making a list when he was about 15 years old of all that he wanted to accomplish, and most of it was around hockey. Uh, what level uh, did he want to ascend? Uh, college scholarship, uh, the NHL, uh, Olympic team. And what was he going to have to do to get there? What challenges was he going to have to create in order to accomplish that? And he said that unfortunate day that the challenges then chose him the biggest challenge of his life. He said when he was in the hospital in Boston or in the uh, rehab center down in Atlanta that he was about at the bottom. He didn't want to be a burden on anyone. He went from walking on air, being the, the, the 
the big time sports star in every community that he was part of to someone that couldn't take care of his most basic needs. And he realized in that moment, as he saw all those people uh, that had even more earth shattering changes to their realities than his, that he had a decision to make. Was he going to find grace? in his life? Was he going to find meaning in his life? Was he going to find hope in his life? Was he going to take that and find all of those things and shine all of those things into other people's lives? And he said, sometimes the challenges choose you, but how you respond to those challenges, how you respond to those challenges are what will define you. Will define you. We are the body of Christ. We define ourselves that way. We are Christians. We define ourselves that way. And this is probably, as a church, the most trying time that most of us have faced in our lifetime of trying to be that body of trying to hold on to that claim to be a follower of the way, a follower of Jesus. How are we going to respond to the challenge? How are we going to respond to the challenge of having to be church when we can't come together in the way that we want to be together? How are we going to respond to the call to be the church when the world seems incredibly divided? When we're wrestling with deep and complex justice issues. We've all made our pledge. We know that how we respond to our challenge has to include how we seek and serve Christ in one another and love our neighbor as ourselves. And not just to the people that we love and miss here in this space or usually here in the space, but to the people that challenge us the most, the people that we need to build bridges toward. How Do we rise to the challenge that will define us as a people, as a community of St. James, and respect the dignity of every human being? How are we going to respond to this moment, this defining moment? We have an absolutely incredible privilege. We get to be part of a communion of saints that have done incredible works through centuries. People that inspired and moved us and people that we never had the privilege of knowing, but they're still part of us. They're still living, moving, being parts of our communion of saints. How are we going to define ourselves in this time? the time that God has given us to carry the church, to not just move the church from that place to the next, but to shine a light boldly and fully and courageously into the world. How are we going to live out of our baptism so that the community of saints, the communion of saints would be able to to continue to be God's heart and hand and light in the world.